and um, he was selling cigarettes, contraband cigarettes, and then they would be at the back of Geylang where they had like open tables. And then the police, the minute you hear, oh, Mata coming there, everybody would just pack and then start scrambling. So I was there and I saw everything happen. There were days where, you know, we had no money and I didn't know what to do. I think it got so desperate for me to the extent that I actually stood at Gilang, so I pretended to be a prostitute. Hi, I'm Ling, I'm 29 years old this year and I'm the co-founder of Project Green Women. I started PGR because I suffered from mental health for many, many years and I couldn't actually find the right resources that was helpful. I wanted to create opportunities for people, opportunities that I did not actually get or receive. And I wanted to create a platform for people, for the unheard to actually be heard. I felt a lot of love, a lot of kindness. Things were just too beautiful and the picture was just beautifully painted. Until one day when things turned around and everything started tumbling down. My parents ended up not actually being my real parents. One day, I think, Mama was sick. So we were at home and then auntie and uncle actually came over. So we're standing at the doorway of the kitchen and then Mama said to me, Ling Ling, this is your mom and dad. And I stood there and I cried. How can it be though? This auntie and uncle like randomly, you're telling me and the, the people that I hate are my parents. He says, no, this, this is your real mom and this is your dad. I had to move. I mean, that was all, right? What else could I have done? And then they changed my name. They changed my school. They changed my lifestyle. My world just crumbled because everything changed. They always called me names. I would say, you're an idiot. Why are you so stupid? Why, why are you so lazy? You don't want to listen. You were spoiled. So I was just blamed for every single thing. Everything was my fault except for them. So nobody else was wrong, only me. I started stealing. So I went to supermarkets, I'll steal food, I'll steal instant noodles. I started sleeping on the streets. Because being on the streets was anywhere better than home. Eventually, whenever I ran away, then my mom would make a police report. I'll always get caught and I'll always be brought back to the police station. The cycle will repeat again, I'll run away again, you know. I'll just keep running along, no matter how, I'll just keep running. I just don't want to be there. Instead of like my primary school friends, I started mixing out with strangers. Just strangers that I meet, you know, I'll go to anybody's house, I'll always ask like, hey, can I stay at your house? Until it got to a point where I was with a guy, so it's like from one friend to another friend to another friend and it just leads to somewhere. I went to his house that day and then um, I was lying down on his bed, you know. I didn't know anything at a point in time. And then he tried to unzip my pants and then he tried to place himself on top of me. So I was just lying down flat, I didn't know anything. And I went to the toilet. I told him I need to go to the toilet. So when I went to the toilet, you know, I noticed that there was blood on my panties and I didn't know what it was. So after some time, I left. You know, I broke up with him. Somewhere along the lines, I must have told somebody because when I went to Gaul's home and I was in remand, the police came and they started to actually question and interview me and they said that it's considered rape. I was underage, first of all. And the second thing was, I didn't give any consent. I didn't even know what was happening. Something that I've never talked about. Actually, I brushed it off a lot. And I just, that's all I remember. And um, he was selling cigarettes, contraband cigarettes. And then they would be at the back of Geylang, where they had like open tables. And then the police, the minute you hear, oh, Mata coming there, everybody would just pack and then start scrambling. So I was there and I saw everything happen. There were days where, you know, we had no money and I didn't know what to do. I think it got so desperate for me to the extent that I actually stood at Gilang, so I pretended to be a prostitute. The thing about it is that I didn't only I didn't only really pretend to be a prostitute. And then, you know, other times I would actually just go in, I would try to steal money from the wallet, I'll tell them to go and shower, you know, can you just go and shower first, go to the toilet and then, and then I'll steal the money and then I'll just run out. I was looking for a job in the newspaper and I once saw this job called um, Guest Relations Officer. It was actually a KTV. I didn't know the ropes, I did not know anything. And I just told them I really needed the job. 
I was about 15 years old then. So they eventually took me in and um, I started sitting with men. I looked at what the girls were doing. They were always sitting on top of the customers. They were always going out of the rooms and going to the toilet like, and I didn't know what was happening. And after some time, of course, I knew like, what was happening. And I started following. I tried following. And at that point in time, being alone was so much more difficult than having sex with someone, you know. So I learned to use my body to actually exchange it for somebody's presence and time. No girls would listen to what I have to say. So what was the other option? Men. Not adults, not children, not teachers, not counsellors, not the police. So I was left with men. Then, because at the point in time, I really suspected I was pregnant, but I wasn't sure because my period didn't come. He looked me straight in the eye and he said this to me, you're a manipulator, because that's not true. And I stood there for the first time in my life, uh, that somebody can look at me straight in the eye uh, and just blatantly lie. After some time, he didn't come back anymore. He started coming back like every three days and then he just gave me a $10 note and one packet of contraband cigarettes and that's it. So I'll be crying from day to night. So at a point in time also, I started taking drugs um, because I, could, I didn't want to feel and I wished that the baby would die. I made a checkup. Somebody told me to go to Hate Road because I wanted to abort the baby. And then I asked them how much would it cost. Be about two thousand dollars. At fifteen years old, two thousand dollars. I I was think I came out of the road and I stand there. I was like, huh? Two thousand dollars. Ah, no matter what I do, also I cannot get two thousand dollars in like two weeks. One. And over time, every single day, I still kept taking drugs. I was crying every single day from morning to night. I could barely sleep. I would cry until I fall asleep. I wouldn't sleep. And then if I take drugs, I wouldn't sleep for like three days. And my depression got worse. I didn't even know what depression was at the point. I just know that I was crying and crying. So I moved out. I was pregnant. And then we didn't even have a lift to that floor, you know. I carried the things out, put the things downstairs. I still remember. Then I have to slowly carry up. Then after it carried down and then worried that nobody would take my things all by myself. On the day when I was going to deliver, I actually, it was about 6 a.m. I went home and I called M. And I said to M, I think I'm going to deliver. Can you bring me to the hospital? And then M said to me, I'm with F eating at Downtown East. I will come after I finish eating. And that was the exact same time when I stood at the window and I looked out of the window and I said, if I'm going to choose M, my baby's going to suffer. If I'm going to choose my baby, it's me who's going to suffer because I'll have to go through the heartbreak, right? I'm going to be upset. The time when actually I delivered, all, I mean, all this while I wanted to give the baby up for adoption. I was very sure about it. So the current place that I was staying, you know, they asked me, what's going to happen to the baby? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to give the baby away for sure. I'm going to give the baby away. But when I delivered and when she came into my arms, that moment and that feeling is something that I can never describe. Instantly, it felt like I love this child so much and I'll do anything to protect her. And I'll never want her to go through whatever that I went through. I actually had a social worker called me from Tai Kwan and said to me this, I'm so sorry, your mom wrote to the director of the centre to actually ask for this baby to be up for adoption. And I, got, I was fuming with anger. I think I called my mom and just scolded her. No, I, you said to me that you would support me, but you did this behind my back. And I had to get a call not from you, but from somebody else, from the social worker, who had apologised to me out of nowhere. And I felt so betrayed. Yeah, so I had no choice. It came to a point where MSF called me, MSF came in. If I didn't give the baby up for adoption, I didn't sign the papers, the baby's going to be taken away from me. So after a I told him, oh, I'm only going to be here for a couple of days, okay, don't worry about me. And then one afternoon, he, after his phone call, I was lying down on his chest. I still remember he was wearing his army t-shirt. Huh? It was, you know, reservist t-shirt. Then he said to me, don't go. Just one word, don't go. And immediately tears rolled down my eyes. Because I've never, I've not seen somebody so soft for a long, long, long time. I was having nightmares every single night. You know, I wake up in shock and crying. I had very bad separation anxiety. The minute I was alone, 
I'll be crying because I'm so scared. I had problems staying out in public because I felt that everybody was looking at me, so I don't take the public transport. And it came to a point where I said, I'm so tired of life. I'm very, very tired. I didn't know what to do. I was feeling desperate every single day. I was depressed every single day. I realized I have different conditions. And I said, it's time for me to start something. I had no idea how to start. I didn't complete my N levels. I didn't complete my O levels. I dropped out. I sat there exactly in this corner. And I figured out how to start a business. There were many, many incidents in my life and blockages in my life, people who I've also met, that has helped me build that resilience I had today. With PGR, we are here to create opportunities for people. We are here to allow the unheard to be heard. I was not heard, and I want people to have a place to be heard. Because your one story can relate to that one person, and if it's just that one person who takes away something from it, you have already impacted one person's life. There is somebody who will understand what you're going through. And as long as you don't give up hope, as long as you keep trying, as long as you keep looking for opportunities, it will eventually take you somewhere.